The Tom Woods Show, episode 568. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello, everybody. I am back from New York City where I had a tremendous time. I got something funny at the end of the episode today. You have to stay tuned. Michael Malice made fun of me on The Kennedy Show on Fox Business the other night, and I'm going to play you just that brief clip in which he refers to me, not by name, of course, but he knows I'll know. So I have to play you the little clip from that weasel Michael Malice. So that's coming at the end. So don't don't quit on the episode just because I'm done talking to you about the 1970s. In this episode, I am going to talk about the 1970s just as a interesting historical moment with particular emphasis on the U.S. economy of the 1970s and how bad it was and how it got to be that bad. That sort of thing is going to be our subject for today. Before I get to that, a little announcement. I've got a webinar coming up for you, for the listeners of this show only, coming up this Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. That's, let's see, what would the date be? That's Thursday, January 14th, 2016. And the special guest on the webinar is my friend Chris Record. Now, Chris is a genius as a marketer, as an entrepreneur, as a product creator, but he's also a Ron Paul supporter. He donated to the 2012 campaign. He used to post Ron Paul videos, as we all did, uh, on our Facebook pages. He did that on his Facebook page. So he's a great guy, but he's going to talk to my audience about how you go from not really knowing what you're doing, going from being a newbie to being an online entrepreneur. And there are just so many opportunities to do this. And I hear a lot of libertarians with a lot of theory about entrepreneurship, but who get downright hostile when you suggest, why don't you actually do it? So he'll actually show us what he does, how he's successful. And successful he indeed is. As I mentioned before, this is a guy who earned $800,000 last year just on affiliate commissions. Now, that's not all for him. He has a team of people who work for him. But he earned twice that on product creation. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to capture leads, build an email list, build the whole infrastructure for an online presence. And he's going to donate $5 for every single person who's on the live webinar. He's going to give $5 to antiwar.com. So if we get 100 people on there, then $500 goes to antiwar.com. So as many people as we can get on there, let's get some dough to antiwar.com, and you will learn from Chris Record. He's super smart, and he's a Ron Paul guy, and he's going to give money to antiwar.com. It's crazy. So sign up at tomwoods.com slash chris, because that's his first name, tomwoods.com slash chris. All right, 1970s here. I'm back from New York. I'm, I'm getting back into the swing of things here. So this episode comes to you from my libertyclassroom.com. This is in the U.S. History Since 1877 course. This is me talking about the 1970s. I think you might enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, libertyclassroom.com is for you. If not, you can pretend this never occurred. But whatever happens, make sure and stay tuned so I can play that weasel's clip at the end. All right, here we go. Today we're going to talk about the 1970s, both the economy and the foreign policy of that decade. Let's start off with the economy. The 1970s is not going to go down in history as one of the high points in U.S. economic history. In the 1950s, the U.S. saw economic growth that was fine, but relatively unremarkable. But in the 1960s, the U.S. saw nine years of economic expansion. Now, what is the explanation for this? The explanation that the mainstream gives, the mainstream among academics, particularly historians, but also the mainstream of uh, more or less the political class at the time and economic advisors was that it was the commitment to and the actual exercise of uh, robust fiscal and monetary policy to fine-tune the economy. That finally, as we saw in our discussion of JFK, we had the experts in charge who knew just how to manage the economy just right, not too much, not too little, just the right amount of growth, just the right amount of employment, just the right amount of production, and they engineered a tremendous expansion. That's the argument that was used. And then another argument, uh, in addition to this, is that the growth in computer technology helped to increase productivity, which of course in turn leads to a stronger economy. 
Arthur Oaken, O-K-U-N, who sat on Lyndon Johnson's Council of Economic Advisors, uh, wrote a book called The Political Economy of Prosperity, a book that came out in 1970. And in that book, he boasted about the economic success of the 1960s. And he argued that it's, again, because we moved past these old-fashioned ideas of balanced budgets and this and that, and now as a result, because now we're willing to engage in deficit spending and intervene in the economy and have a kind of council of economic helmsmen guiding the economy, well, the results are all around you, he said. Uh, it's a kind of poetic justice, however, that the economy turned down one month after the release of Oaken's book. The, the, the stagnation, sometimes called stagflation, because it, it had a stagnant economy plus high price inflation, uh, was the payback for the wild experiments of the 1960s. But Oaken claimed, uh, not seeing what was coming, that the business cycle the boom-bust cycle of the economy, where the economy is doing well, and then very badly, and then well, and very badly. We've tamed this, he said. We tamed this in the 60s. He said, this is quoting from his book, The Political Economy of Prosperity, a book I read at the urging of Mises Institute senior fellow Mark Thornton. He said, when recessions were a regular feature of the economic environment, they were often viewed as inevitable. Indeed, the Dr. Panglosses saw them as contributors to the health of our best of all possible economies, correcting for the excesses of the boom, purging the poisons out of our productive and financial systems, and restoring vigor for new advances. And he went on to say, more vigorous and more consistent application of the tools of economic policy contributed to the obsolescence of the business cycle pattern. Now, I remind you, the best indicator that a business cycle is about to turn down, that the economy is about to hit a low point, is that the mainstream says that there won't be any more low points, there won't be any more cycles, no more cyclical pattern, we'll just have prosperity and that'll be it. That's when you know it's coming down. They said that in the 1920s. They said it right here in 1970 following the performance of the 1960s. Alan Greenspan at the end of the 1990s was saying that maybe booms don't have to be followed by busts, which a sustainable boom doesn't, but not the type of boom that the Federal Reserve gives us. And then finally, the housing bubble of the early 2000s, we were told that, that was just based on strong fundamentals and nothing to see here. And then, of course, that's when the bad news comes. Oaken says that Franklin Roosevelt had succeeded in using Keynesian fiscal policy. So that is to say... Uh, in the case of FDR, increases in government spending and willingness to engage in government deficit spending, and that this had been a great success in the 1930s, according to Oaken. Uh, the earlier view that budgets uh, had to be balanced and spending had to be cut, these are not based in rational economics, said Oaken. This is just a silly superstition. But as I say, a month after his book was published, the recession began in 1970. Unemployment went from 4% to 6% by the end of 1970, back to 5% in 1973, but up to 9% in 1975. This was the highest rate seen since the Great Depression. It stayed above the normal, what at that time was the normal 5% level, for the next two decades. And that included 10 double-digit months during 1982 to 1983. And Americans also suffered very high prices. I, I alluded to that briefly earlier. Now, from the beginning of 1946 to the beginning of 1965, so the period, it's just going into the middle of the decade that, that uh, led to, that, that culminated in the recession of 1970, we saw the consumer price in, index increase from 46 to 65 by 71.4 percent. But then just from 1965 to 1970, we saw it increase another 20 percent just throughout the rest of the decade. Now from 1965, which is when this kind of interventionist experiment really began in earnest, and where Lyndon Johnson's really got to print money if he's going to have both his war on poverty and his war in Vietnam, from 1965 to the end of 1980, the CPI, that is the Consumer Price Index, 
increased by 176.6%. So it turns out you can't bring bread from stones after all. And the result was the high prices that Americans suffered through, as well as the stagnant economy. It's also worth noting what was going on on the stock market. And here I quote from uh, Dr. Thornton, Mark Thornton, who says this, In May 1970, a portfolio consisting of one share of every stock listed on the big board was worth just about half of what it would have been worth at the start of 1969. The high flyers that had led the market of 1967 and 1968, conglomerates, computer leasers, far-out electronics companies, franchisers, were precipitously down from their peaks. Nor were they down 25% like the Dow, but 80, 90, or 95%. This was vintage 1929 stuff, and the prospect of another Great Depression this one induced as much by despair as by economic factors as such was a very real one. The stock market, as measured by the Dow, did decrease 25% between 1969 and 1971, and then lost another 20% by mid-1975. However, the real losses in the stock market were, lar were larger and longer lasting than an ordinary chart of the Dow might suggest. The Dow Index shows that stocks tended to trade in a wide channel for much of the period between 1965 and 1984. However, if you adjust the value of stocks by price inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, a clearer and more disturbing picture emerges. The inflation-adjusted or real purchasing power measure of the Dow indicates that it lost nearly 80% of its peak value. That's Mark Thornton. Now, to deal with the 1970 recession, the Federal Reserve wanted to ease monetary policy. It wants to print money to get the country out of the recession. And, and we can talk in our discussion forums and can learn in our economics courses here in the Liberty Classroom about that and whether, in fact, that helps. The conventional wisdom is that that can help. Well, I, I don't think it does, and we can talk in detail about the economic arguments here. But they want to ease monetary policy to deal with the 1970 recession. But if they do that, they're going to be in conflict with their own stated goal of slowly reducing the rate of growth, growth of the money supply. They're seeing prices go up. They want to reduce money growth. But at the same time, to get the economy out of the recession, they want to increase money growth. So the Federal Reserve Chairman at that time, Arthur Burns, suggested wage and price controls as a supplement to monetary policy, and that would keep the effects of price inflation down. So we keep printing the money, but we just we simply won't allow prices to rise. We'll, we'll keep them down by law, so we won't allow prices to rise commensurately. That's all you need to do, just pass a law and that solve your problem. So the Economic Stabilization Act of 1970 gave the president authority to impose economic controls. It was mid-August 1971 that President Nixon exercised that power. Now first on that day he did something else. He famously, uh, August 15th, 1971, closed the gold window, which simply means that foreign governments and central banks could no longer redeem their dollars for gold. It used to be that dollars, the world reserve currency, which means that a lot of commodity transactions are carried out in, in, in the doll using dollars, and the dollar had been uh, allowed to be uh, exchanged at the central bank in the U.S. in exchange for, for gold, $35 an ounce. Uh, American citizens certainly couldn't get gold for their money. That, <laughs> those poor suckers were, were stripped of that power in the early 1930s. But foreigners still could do it. The problem was that the U.S. government had been creating so many dollars these foreign governments were piling up so many dollar reserves, they began to be unsure about the stability of the dollar and whether it really would be worth what they were more or less assured it would be. So there were a lot of demands, particularly starting around 1968, for redemption in gold. And that accelerated, particularly into 1971, to the point where there wouldn't have been any gold left if Nixon hadn't closed the window. So instead of trying to stop the growth of the money supply or any such thing as that, Nixon just said, well, you can't get any gold anymore. That's it. I'm closing the window. 
But it was that same day that wage and price controls were suddenly imposed. And this, this took everybody by surprise. All, all, all of a sudden, a lot of times today, we hear policies debated for weeks or months on end before they're actually implemented. Uh, so it would be a great surprise if all of a sudden today we saw wage and price control suddenly introduced. Well, that's what it was like in August 1971. And, and the, the price controls went through uh, four phases. And uh, by the, toward the end of these phases in August 1973, finally the transition away from price controls uh, begins to be seen, and all the controls were ended by April 1974. And it, it didn't really solve any problems, it just merely papered over a, a lot of problems. And then couple that with what's going on with oil and gas. OPEC, the so-called Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, had been recently formed, and it cut production, which meant, obviously, higher prices. So in response, Nixon and Ford, uh, Ford was, was uh, Nixon's, uh, Gerald Ford was Nixon's uh, successor, of course, uh, imposed price controls at home in the United States. And the result was long lines and frustration on the part of consumers. And, of course, the price controls did two things that, that both exacerbated the problem. It both discouraged production at home, because if, if you can sell it at only X amount, then you're less likely to produce more than if you're allowed to sell it at whatever amount. So it discouraged bringing more supply online. And secondly, it discouraged conservation at home, because if, if prices rise, then you're going to make sure and use gas only for the most urgent reasons. But if prices are, are kept down artificially, you don't realize you're not as, as aware in your pocketbook of the existence of the shortage, and you might just continue to go on leisurely Sunday drives that, frankly, the, the stock of supply doesn't justify. So people begin to uh, engage in irrational behavior from the point of view of the stock of gasoline that existed. So this is, and there are all kinds of perver other perverse outcomes of price controls. Well, it wasn't until Jimmy Carter, who was elected in 1976, who was a Democrat, who finally began the, the process of, of the decontrol of petroleum and gasoline. And it was, in turn, his successor, Ronald Reagan, who finally finished the job. And critics warned that decontrol, government decontrol, would be followed by a spike upward in prices. But in fact, not long afterward, prices began to fall and continued to fall, in fact, throughout the 1980s. Now, in foreign policy, the 1970s, early 1970s, were characterized by a policy called detente, a kind of easing of tensions. The United States government was eager to see uh, detente, to see an easing of tensions between the two superpowers, in part because they hoped that the Soviet Union could in some way help assist in extricating the United States from Vietnam. Richard Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, who played a much more significant role in forming foreign policy than the Secretary of State did. In fact, Nixon and Kissinger did so much uh, foreign policy-wise that the rest of the cabinet wound up finding out about in the reading in the newspaper. But Nixon and Kissinger sought assistance from the Soviet Union, and w they were also looking for stability and order in the Third World where the Soviets were beginning to make gains. They wanted an arms control agreement. And also as part of the deal was a, a, a kind of an implicit uh, sense that Nixon would be willing to overlook some of the various Soviet barbarities at, at home and abroad. Uh, the Soviets were not altogether interested in this. They were partly interested. Uh, naturally, they'd like to save money on weapons systems, so some of it is all right. Uh, they would welcome an anti-ballistic missile treaty and they certainly could use infusions of Western capital as well as agricultural assistance. They weren't so interested in slowing down in the third world because they felt like now we're making gains, now the U.S. wants to freeze the status quo. They weren't so interested in that, and they weren't super interested in helping to extricate the U.S. from, from Vietnam, but I'll get back to that in a minute. The other thing that's worth noting around this time, there's also a kind of detente, is that in mid-1971, the world was abruptly informed that Henry Kissinger had just returned from Beijing and had had a meeting with the Chinese government. They also learned that Nixon himself would travel to China the following year. 
So there was going to be an opening of the U.S. government to China, and it was thought that China could also play a role in helping the U.S. in Vietnam, because the uh, Chinese and the Soviet Union had a sort of rivalrous relationship, and perhaps the U.S. could sort of play them off each other. Because now the Soviet Union was not happy to learn about these meetings between the U.S. government and the Chinese government. They had a very tense and rivalrous relationship, the Soviets and the Chinese. And so basically what was coming clear was that if the Soviets did not respond to Nixon's overtures for detente, then they might drive the U.S. into a still friendlier relationship with China, which they had no desire to see. At the same time, though, as I say, they had little desire to help extricate the United States from Vietnam. From their point of view, from the Soviet point of view, the war in Vietnam was an unbelievable boon that they, in their wildest dreams, they could barely have thought to ask for. It was a huge net plus to them and an obvious detriment, they believed, to the United States. Well, how so? Well, let me quote a passage from historian Warren Cohen, who says, The war drained American resources, exacerbated tensions within American society, alienated NATO allies as well as third world countries, and heightened Vietnamese dependence on the Soviet Union. In blood, in treasure, in the sullying of America's image around the world, the war in Vietnam was enormously costly to the United States and a great boon to the Soviet Union. The first SALT Treaty, a uh, SALT Agreement, uh, S-A-L-T, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, uh, was signed in Moscow in May 1972, so a kind of reflection of detente. It limited the deployment of ABM systems, anti-ballistic ballistic missile systems, defensive uh, systems, but extremely costly and technologically very tricky. But uh, relatively little progress was made on offensive weapons. Uh, detente suffered a setback the following year when war erupted in the Middle East and the Soviet uh, the Soviet government was helping to incite the Arab countries against Israel, which of course in turn en enjoyed American support. And then the following year, 1974, Nixon was forced to resign in the so-called Watergate scandal, uh, in which a, a burglary at the Democratic National Committee headquarters that was tied to Nixon's re-election campaign uh, began to cause great difficulty for Nixon, especially as it turned out that it became obvious that he had tried to cover up evidence of the break-in, which he himself uh, very unlikely actually ordered, but uh, he wanted to cover it up. And then if, if he had allowed an investigation of that to unravel, it would have been discovered all the various other things that he'd been up to, all the various dirty tricks and, and, uh, and the like that he had carried out against his political opponents. And, and Lyndon Johnson had done that, and Kennedy had done that. That was really, even, even FDR had done that. That was nothing terribly new, but Nixon nevertheless uh, crossed the line and also had a very unfriendly media and the combination of that meant uh, ultimately that he was forced to resign and more and more Republicans began to desert him and finally he just saw the writing on the wall. Now following the the end of, of, of uh, the whole story of in Vietnam, because in, in 1975 the Saigon regime uh, did collapse there was temporarily less interest among the American public in military intervention in the third world. They just began to think that nothing going on there could be important enough to justify getting involved in another extremely costly venture, costly in terms of both lives and money, uh, like the Vietnam War. Now Kissinger, who continued on in government following Nixon's departure, continued on under Gerald Ford, was concerned about this. Uh, he, he didn't want the American public to be in the mood to disengage. So uh, he advocated sending in the Marines when the Cambodian communists seized the Mayagüe, which was an American vessel. And so the, the Ford administration did that. Uh, even though the captives had already been released by the time the U.S. government's operation began, and it turns out that more of the putative rescuers died in the what would have been the, the rescue mission than there had been prisoners. But the, po the point was this just shows that the U.S. government is going to continue to have a vigorous foreign policy uh, re response in the world. But following uh, Gerald Ford's relatively unremarkable and truncated term as president, uh, we have Jimmy Carter. 
Now, Carter was uh, really torn. He's really pulled in two directions throughout his tenure in terms of foreign policy. Because on the one hand, he had a pro-detente Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, but he had a much more bellicose national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, Carter announced his intention to make human rights a centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. He, was, uh, he found deeply distasteful the, the realpolitik of Kissinger and pre previous administrations, where they were willing to countenance or even encourage some pretty terrible behavior in order to get uh, concessions for the U.S. or make friends with relatively distasteful regimes. Uh, Carter wanted to try to abandon that or modify that. So the result was basically a, a very confused and a, a foreign policy that sometimes was relatively peaceful, sometimes bellicose, and, and, and just went from one side to the other. The Soviets during these years became more aggressive in Africa. We saw Soviet-friendly forces taking power in Nicaragua and, and elsewhere, and as that begins to happen, Carter begins to become more sympathetic to Brzezinski's outlook on the Soviet Union and the world. Carter uh, is, is remembered in particular for having brokered the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel. The, pro the whole process angered the Soviets who had been excluded from the, the, the talks and so this was considered to be a slight because they're supposed to be a superpower and here's a major diplomatic breakthrough taking place without any input from them whatsoever. They were seeing what had previously been their most important Middle Eastern ally absorbed into the U.S. orbit. Uh, Egypt becomes much friendlier with the United States. So what exactly is going on in the Camp David Accord? Well, Egypt, like other Middle Eastern countries, had lost territory to Israel in the Six-Day War of 1967, and Egypt in particular had lost the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian leader, in this agreement gets the Sinai Peninsula back and agrees to extend official recognition to Israel, which the other Arab states were not extending diplomatic recognition to Israel because of various grievances they had. And this broke the what had previously been a united Arab coalition against the Jewish state. So it was a, a great step forward from Israel's point of view. It was an exceedingly unpopular agreement throughout the Middle East, however. The view on the street was that Sadat had sold out the Arab cause in exchange for getting his territory back. Uh, Sadat, in particular, was viewed as having sold out the Palestinians, who, that is to say, the people who had lived in the physical territory that later became Israel, and that during the, uh, from, from uh, late 47 into early 49, had been driven out of their homes in the course of the, the fighting that ensued, well, there had always been an insistence that one of our, one of the Arabs' grievances was that the Palestinians needed to have the right to return, a right of return to their homes that they had been driven from must be a centerpiece of any agreement reached with Israel. And the Camp David Accords had said nothing about that, were silent about the right of return. So when Sadat died, there was no outpouring of grief in Egypt, as you might have seen uh, with, with other, other leaders, like as you saw with, with Nasser, for example. Now, Carter does get another SALT agreement signed, SALT II, uh, an agreement that actually many analysts believe favored the U.S., and, and this was at a time when an increasingly exhausted Soviet economy just had to cut back on military expenditures. But SALT II was inadvertently sent to its doom by Senator Frank Church, a Democrat from Idaho, who was actually a pro-detente senator. And the way that happened was that uh, he, Church was fighting for re-election against uh, a candidate who was very, very anti-Soviet. Well, every, basically everybody was anti-Soviet, but particularly uh, vigorous in, in his anti-Soviet posture. So Church wanted to make clear that he too was anti-Soviet. So what he did during his campaign for U.S. Senate from Idaho was that he pointed out that there was a Soviet combat brigade in Cuba and demanded that the Soviets remove it. Well, the U.S. had acquiesced in the presence of that brigade for, for many years, and the understanding was that as long as the Soviet Union didn't reinforce its presence on Cuba, well, it would be allowed to maintain the posture that it, it had. This was the 
situation that had existed for, for years. It was a sort of mutual understanding. But Jimmy Carter got caught up in the political turmoil surrounding uh, Senator Church's demand, joined in that demand. Well, the Soviet Union refused to retreat from a position that they had been allowed since the 1960s, and since they hadn't reinforced that position, as they had promised not to, their argument was they had nothing to retreat from. And so because of that, additional ammunition had been given to anti-salt forces in the Senate. And there went, there went the agreement. In January 1979, the Shah of Iran fled his country uh, out of fear of anti-government forces. And eventually he was allowed into the U.S. Uh, for what were said to be medical reasons. He went to the, uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic for uh, some procedures. And by November, is Islamic fundamentalists who looked to the Ayatollah Khomeini as their leader took over the United States Embassy in Iran and held those inside hostage for 14 months. So the, the, the Shah was associated with the United States because, because of course he had been installed in his position in a CIA directed coup in 1953 that everybody knew about. He'd been a US government friend all those years. The CIA had helped him train his secret police and finally this was coming to uh, to bite the United States in the you-know-where. Also that year, 1979, in December, the communist regime that had come to power in Afghanistan in April 1978 was coming apart. And the Soviets did not want unrest in a country on its borders whose peoples were ethnically related to Soviet peoples in Central Asia. So the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter, outraged, responded with a grain embargo, a U.S. boycott of the Summer Olympics, which were to be held in Moscow, and called for an arms buildup in the United States. Now, interestingly, what we now know is, uh, is, is uh, we found out uh, the late 1990s, is that uh, Carter's own policy had not merely been reactive. It hadn't simply been the Soviets intervened and then... Carter responded. Carter had actually taken some initiative uh, that would in fact prov have the effect of provoking the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the first place. So Zbigniew Brzezinski pointed out years later, and, and here I quote him, according to the official version of history, the CIA assistance to the Mujahideen, which is the sort of Islamic freedom fighters, so-called in Afghanistan, fighting against the Soviets, the CIA assistance to the Mujahideen began during 1980, i.e. after the Soviet army had invaded Afghanistan on December 24, 1979. But the reality, kept secret until now, is very different. It was July 3, 1979, when President Carter signed the first directive on the clandestine assistance to opponents of the pro-Soviet regime in Kabul. On that day, I wrote a note to the president in which I explained that, in my opinion, this aid would bring about a military intervention by the Soviets. We did not push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability that they would. Now, finally, a passage, uh, one more from historian uh, Warren Cohen, reminding us of what, relatively speaking, a paper tiger the Soviet Union really was at the time in spite of all the fears in the United States uh, at, at the time, uh, fears that, that vastly overstated how possible it would be to have a socialist superpower. It was like Americans temporarily forgot that this is a socialist basket case, and maybe it's not as, as, uh, as dangerous as it appears. Cohen says this, the glorious achievement of parity with the United States, the exhilarating sense that the correlation of forces in the world favored the Soviet Union, the joy of traveling the road to world leadership, had hardly been savored before the foundations of the Soviet Empire began to give way. The army, no matter how brutally it performed its duties, could not crush Afghani guerrilla forces, supplied primarily by the Chinese and Americans. The economy, ramshackle at best, could not stand the strain of subsidies to allies like Cuba and Vietnam, the price of empire. And now there was likely to be a new and costly arms race with the United States. Fearful of Soviet communism, Americans had long exaggerated the threat posed by the Soviet Union. 
In 1980, many Americans perceived the Soviet Union on the offensive, poised to achieve its goal of world domination. Brezhnev and the other party ancients reveled in that vision, but the reality was a regime everywhere on the defensive. In summary, or to conclude, 1970s was a time of economic stagnation, was a time of a, a lack of confidence in the future of the United States, and it was a time of, of crisis. And this was not good for an incumbent president, namely Jimmy Carter. The ongoing hostage crisis in Iran, combined with a very bad economy, which had high unemployment, high inflation, uh, interest rates in excess of 21 percent, was bad news for Jimmy Carter, but very good news for the man who would replace him, Ronald Reagan. All right, the show notes page will be tomwoods.com slash 568. I don't know what I'm going to put on it. I'll think of something. I must be something relevant to the 1970s. I'll put, well, I'll put the link to the webinar on there. What the heck? Tomwoods.com slash Chris. Learn the fundamentals of online entrepreneurship. How do you build an email list? How do you drive traffic? How do you convert that traffic into sales? I'm sure this kind of stuff is congenial to a free market uh, audience. So definitely make sure and join us on that webinar on Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Sign up at tomwoods.com slash chris. All right, here's Michael Malice. Now, here's the deal. I went to New York City. Heather and I were in New York City for about a week. We went to a whole bunch of Broadway shows. We've always wanted to do this. Just go to a whole bunch. And uh, we went to some nice restaurants, and we did some visiting and so on. And I kind of just learned about the check-in feature on Facebook. So on my personal account, which I don't use for anything else, I use my so-called fan page, which is facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods all the time. But on my personal account, which I don't really use, I use it to check in. I just learned you go to some place, you click check in. Everybody knows you're there. So I checked in at every show we went to, every restaurant, every museum. Like I checked in to everything. I didn't. I checked it. I, I got a haircut and I didn't check in for that. But otherwise, I checked in for everything. And Michael saw how excited I was to check in for things. We, we went to the. We went out to eat and then we went to the Museum of Natural History together. And that's a lot of fun because he's an expert on a lot of that stuff. He's an expert on uh, sea life and, and anyway, tremendous. The point is, he knew I was obsessed with checking in. So here's what he has to say about this whole El Chapo Sean Penn controversy that's going on. He was asked to comment on it on Kennedy on Fox Business. And here's what that weasel had to say. I think Sean Penn is like one of those dorky people who use Facebook to check in wherever they go on their trip, <laughs> just so all their friends think that they're cool. My friend was just here visiting New York, and every Broadway show he checked in so everyone could see. And I'm sure that's what he did. That's why it was easy. So, All right, I don't know what I'm going to do with that guy. I got him coming on later this week. We're going to talk about North Korea because of what's been going on in the news. But I don't know. If you have any suggestions how I can get back at that guy, because I, you know, I, I don't live in New York, and I don't get on TV these days. I can angle to do that, but I... You know, I've done that, and it's fun, and, I, you know, it's great, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty happy with my life as it is, and I don't really want to fly around the country. If you can imagine, I probably sound like a snob. You don't want to fly around the country to be on TV? I really don't. If it's going to be a super gigantic audience, I might be able to talk myself into it, but I'd rather confine my travel to family time and stuff like that. I'm really mellowing out as I am continuing through middle age, but anyway, who knows what I'm going to do with that weasel? Let's see, what are we going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to talk about humanitarian intervention. And does, is that a good reason? Are humanitarian reasons good reasons for uh, interv military intervention? I think that's a really good and interesting topic. So stay tuned for that, and I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.